Good morning and welcome to Kentucky State University. Our third Thursday thing will start in five minutes. Thank you for attending.
a lot of different programs that you can join in on. But today we'll be talking about small ruminants and I want to introduce um, Derek Jeffries with Jeffries Farms. He'll be talking about uh, kidding and direct marketing. Hey everybody, you hear me pretty good. Thank you, Joni, for the invite. Uh, Ashley, for having me, it means a lot. We get on the sound. Um, we're gonna be talking. All right, there we go. Uh, we're gonna be talking about kidding and marketing. Um, I am not an extension employee, so we're not gonna get into a lot of facts and you need to feed this to get this kind of conversion rate. That's not my forte. Um, I deal with marketing on a day-to-day -day basis with my business, um, and we've been raising goats for 20 years now. So um, we're gonna talk about real life experiences, what I've done um, on the marketing side of things, um, how we're able to push that forward. Um, there's Jeffrey's Farms, uh, which is a business that my mother and father, my brother, and my wife and I to do together. Um, we're out of Newcastle, Kentucky, and Henry County, born and raised there. Um, we've been raising goats since 2000. Uh, we primarily focus on the uh, club goat, market goat sector, um, selling to Fortune and FFA kids. We, that is a doe that we raised that was the uh, Grand Oak Kentucky State Fair last year. Uh, we sell goats all over the country to Fortune and FFA kids. Um, and then that's a picture of my, my family, uh, Amanda, Rhett, and Sloan are in the back here with my mother-in-law. Thank you for coming. Um, the Jeffrey Sales Marketing is a component that we added just a few years ago. We've been doing that for about six years now. Um, we do logos, uh, program consulting for different individuals. Um, gives me a really cool insight to be able to wear both hats as a producer and as a marketer for different people. Um, either short-term projects or we work with some people on a much broader scale um, <clears throat> with adapting their program, find a niche, mar niche market for them to, to push forward within their program. Um, <clears throat> the biggest thing we're gonna talk about today, like I said, is not gonna be particulars, but we need to talk about you and your program, whatever that is. Um, we get a show of hands, we're not gonna do jazzercise this morning, but kind of for my reference, if you raise your hand, if you raise goats as your small ruminant of choice, and sheep as your small ruminant of choice. Okay, um, I'm try to speak in generalities. Um, there are differences, there's a lot of crossover. Um, I know more of the goat side of it, sorry. But uh, there is quite a bit of crossover, and I think about everything that we're speaking to. Um, you can find value in both. And if you don't, uh, please let me know. Um, this is gonna be a shorter presentation. I wanna try to dive into the actual issues that you're having either here, or if Ashley has any questions um, from people that are joining us virtually, I uh, would love to dive deeper into individual things for you. So the biggest thing we're gonna talk about is what are your goals? What do you wanna do? Um, we wouldn't be here if we didn't enjoy small ruminants, um, just at the baseline level. Um, like looking at them, like feeding them, whatever it is, like the grandkids to play with them, whatever it is for you, you like them. So that's why we're here. After we've addressed that, what are you wanting to do with them? Are they gonna be a hobby? Are they gonna be a fun pet to have? That's great. Probably don't need to listen to the whole bunch of the rest of my presentation, but that's a sector that, that's part of this world and that's a very valid and real thing. Are you gonna try to market your animals directly to a consumer? Are you gonna do Farm, farmer's market sales, are you gonna do something like that? Are you going to try to sell to other producers, um, seed stock, or what, how are you, where do you fall within the grand scheme of this industry? Um, define that goal early, I think is key. Um, and then, I mean, that can change, but as long as we have a plan, um, we can kind of dictate where we're gonna go with it from there. <clears throat> so after we t figure out what our goals are, um, and what that exactly is. We need to talk about the facilities that you have and the time that which you have to dedicate to this project, to this endeavor. Um, everything in life comes down to time and money. You either have got a whole lot of money and it doesn't take a whole lot of time to get the results you want, or you don't have a whole lot of money and you gotta be willing to invest some time into it to get the rewards that you wanna have. Um, 
Some people do this as a full-time job. Some people do this for fun with their families on the weekend. Um, where do you fall within that? And that can dictate a lot of where you are going to, is your goal, goal attainable? Is that something that you can do? Um, if you're working, you and your wife are working a full-time job, and you say you want to run 300 head and you want to sell everything direct to consumer on farmers markets every Saturday and Tuesday evening, that might not be realistic. Um, if you're telling me that this is all you do, your whole livelihood, and if you don't make enough X number of dollars in uh, meat sales, then your family's not going to be able to survive, then probably we can work that out. But where do you fall within your time is huge. Um, I didn't break down exactly money. I chose to change to facilities um, because the facilities is our biggest component of cost um, outside of our time, which is worth something. A lot of people don't take that into account either. But if you have a repurposed tobacco barn that you're using for lambing, kidding, processing, whatever it may be, um, if you have to build something, if it's a pole barn, if you're in a concrete floor for sandy purposes, if you have dirt floor, all those options within there change your facility cost, facility upkeep, facility maintenance, and everything else. So, one, so I think those are the two biggest components that we must talk about after we define our goals. After we've decided those two things, um, we're going to talk about our market. So what are you selling? What are you wanting to sell? What are you hoping to sell? Um, we can take it all the way on the spectrum of the hobby side of it. Are you going to be selling time with your animals at petting zoos? All the way to, are we going to do something very hands-on, pushing for farmer's markets, meeting people, pushing out, all that? Where do you land on that as far as your market? Um, a couple key markets that we're going to kind of talk about. Um, this, these can be expanded. If somebody has a question specifically about something and wants to talk about something further, um, but I think there's three main areas. That's your wean kids to sale barn. That's what everybody knows. That's cattle, that's goats, that's sheep, that's everything. Wean your product, maybe feed it for a little while, maybe not. Take it to the sale barn. Whatever that price is that day, that's what you get. That's what you bring home. There's nothing wrong with that model. There's nothing wrong with any of these models that we're going to talk about. It's just what works for you and your family. Um, second big one we're going to talk about is replacement seed stock being either... Uh, females that you are selling to other producers, um, males that you're selling to other producers, or taking to uh, test sites to be tested for um, rate per day, rate gain of rate per day of age gain, um, parasite resistance. There's all sorts of different variables that you could try to up upcharge, upsell your males on that as well. Um, and then the third one that I think is a little less self-explanatory that I'd like to kind of dive in deeper and try to add more value to you all is that value-added product. Um, we've already talked about that first one quite a bit, but the direct-to-consumer meat sales, which is your farmer's markets, your online sales, whether that's through social media, if you've created your own website that has shipping options available, um, and then kind of a tangent off of that is your drop shipping options so that your market isn't Frankfort, Kentucky. It isn't your small hometown farmer's market of the same 30 people that come every week. You can sell stuff to Lexton. You can sell stuff to New York. You can sell stuff to wherever the UPS or FedEx will ship stuff in a box. Um, expanding that horizon, um, that presents its own issues or challenges, not issues, challenge, issues is a bad term, but challenges um, and that you have to sell your story of what you're doing. Um, talking about your family, what you do, what these things mean to you, um, trying to convey to that person to pick your leg of lamb instead of buying it from the butcher shop down the street or buying it from Costco or buying it from any of the other big box stores. Um, can be done takes more time, back to what we were talking about earlier. Um, another big thing that we, we personally deal with um, is the contract reset sales uh, to producers with embryo transfer programs. Um, we work with a few uh, commercial seed stock producers, um, and we take so many of their doe kids every year. Um, 
well, we, a lot of what we do with that is post weaning, they will background those doe kids for so long, um, similar to a CPH 45 deal like they have in cattle. Um, getting those does right, getting them on a good feed regimen, getting them bunk broke, getting them medicated. Um, then we will take that group of females and keep them together throughout maturity. We feed them out for a whole year um, and then use them as recipients for our embryo transfer program. We've had a really good conception rate with that, um, kind of keeping that group of like-minded females together throughout their whole maturity, um, putting on the same program, same shot protocol, same everything else. Um, there's a need for that sector that a lot of people don't realize um, in sheep and goats. Um, and I think that this kind of market is a niche little market that's hard to find, but once you get it, that could be kind of a, a streamline for you and your family for years to come from the same producer trying to replace those females that didn't take embryos for whatever reason, were a bad mom, older, trying to recycling those through, um, but that eight to 12, 15 head of does or ewe lambs every year kind of circling through, I think is a realistic number for a lot of people to produce one and then sell through this, this program. Um, and then another thing, I think another um, speaker today is gonna talk about, Mr. Neville, is contract grazing for property management. Um, it involves time um, for the setting up the appointment, setting up the time to move the livestock for what, whatever the purpose may be. Is it taking everything down to the ground? Is it maintain a six inch growth pattern on all the forages available or managing that itself? Um, again, takes time, uh, takes the facilities, the netting, the barns, the movable huts, the, the trailer, everything else. Um, so definitely something to look into if that's what you're looking for. Um, just, and you could do a, a, multiples of these. Um, it doesn't have to be one and done. Um, trying to add value to your females through a reset program or just getting rid of all your males because you're tired of looking at them and you don't want to do it anymore. Um, there's, you can do that too. So you don't have to pigeonhole yourself into this one model, you have to do it the whole time for always and forever, um, even within different contemporary groups in the same year. Um, and surely you don't have to stick with anything for forever. So try something out, if it doesn't work, or wow, that time commitment to make sure that we get all the coolers full and put to the farmer's market every Saturday was just too much, so we're not gonna do that anymore. But if you're willing to try it and look at it, um, and there's a need for your pocketbook to have more money uh, at your bottom line at the end of the day, I think it's something worth looking into. So we're gonna kind of talk about um, kidding briefly. Um, as from an experience standpoint from myself, from doing this for 23 years with my family, um, not as much, this is what you should do, you need to have this many square feet to make sure that it's optimal kidding and lambing conditions, but this is kind of what we do, and having these, these practices in place can help you with the other portions we're talking about with your, your marketing sections. So we've been talking about facilities a lot, um, Kind of the two extremes of that are the pasture kidding, pasture lambing. Um, mom out on pasture, hopefully it's relatively flat and doesn't have a creek at the bottom, but relatively good pasture. She lambs out there, she kids out there. You go check on her. Everything is rocking and rolling. You tag everything. Everything's good. By far the least investment, the least time consuming for you. Um, a lot of ways it's the way to go. The big issue with that is the timing of the year that you have to do that in. Um, it can be done. We've had some does check or sneak up on us and kid out in the middle of the barn lot in January and everything was fine. We've also walked out there and found dead ones too. So making sure that your timing's right, your buck or ram management is in place, if that's gonna be the route that you wanna take, um, is huge. Um, just something to consider and there's trade-offs for everything. Um, the other extreme is a kidding room. Uh, that bottom right picture there is our barns at home. Uh, the one towards the middle of the picture, that'd be our doe barn or what we call. We have some does and bucks in there. 
Uh, and that's where we kid everything out and we've refurbished the stripping room of our tobacco barn. Um, that's the picture to the top part. And um, we have all of our kidding pins in there. Um, it is not heated. Um, it's more or less insulated, kind of, depending on how everything goes. But that barn for the most, or that sh stripping room converted into a kidding room, um, we can bring in supplemental heat but for the most part, we don't do much of that. And most nights, that room never has frozen water. Um, for us, it's just making, sh it doesn't have to be hot. I don't want it to be hot because I can't maintain hot all winter long. But if we can make sure that the waters aren't frozen or there's just that little skim of ice on top, babies are good. We get a small confined space, add straw, add moms, add babies, body heat, everything else. That'll raise that temperature quite a bit. Um, we're incredibly blessed that my grandparents' farm that my parents bought that has these two barns on it, the barns were already there. We're utilizing our resources as, as best we can. Um, that would be a huge investment if we were to build those barns today. Um, price of steel, price of wood, price of labor, everything else is skyrocketing, and the price of that barn is getting more expensive every day to replace. So I understand that. Um, we go as far as with the goats that we're raising, we have kidding cameras in the barn so that we can look at a TV screen and say, oh, 710 is about the kid, we better head out to the barn because we don't have the barn and our house on the same property. We live about five miles away. So we can, we can chime in and see, oh, we need to get there, this one's having trouble. Oh, that kid hasn't gotten up in two hours. We need to go check them out. Um, we could insulate the whole thing, we could heat the whole thing with a mini split. I mean, there, the possibilities are endless with what you want to spend uh, or what you want to do. Um, but just find that right balance for you all and for what you want to do. Um, the second biggest thing is the time required. Um, so kind of tying that back into the facilities that we've talked about, the pasture kidding, by far the lowest time requirement. Um, some people don't even bother looking at stuff until they, oh, it's been a week, I haven't seen them, so we're gonna go check them out. Um, I don't like that personally, but if that's all the time you have, then that's all the time you have. Um, all the way to kind of the other extreme that we kind of practice of the kidding cameras, we're checking everything, we're going out there, we're looking at moms, somebody's laying eyes on them every two hours during that week kidding window that we know everything is because we've synchronized everything and 20 goes are in a kid in this week. Um, so wherever you fall on that spectrum that aligns with your goals that we talked about in the beginning and everything else can all fluctuate together. Um, the other big portion of kidding is your feeding resources, not only for the babies but for the mothers as well. Um, pasture only, by far the easiest, by far the cheapest. Um, well, maybe not the cheapest, price of land goes up every day too. But doing that portion is definitely the easiest. Um, confinement feeding, either that is putting does into kidding pens, lambing pens early, jugs, if you want to call them that, early, feeding them individually, graining them the whole time, groups of five, groups of 10, groups of 20, whatever that is, um, and keep those girls together. Um, you can manage them a whole lot easier that way. You can fluctuate things, you can say, oh, she's gotta come over here, she's not getting enough. We need to give her a little more groceries. Um, you can manipulate things a little bit more that way. It's a way more expensive. Uh, feed prices have gone through the roof for us. Um, it's our biggest line item that we have. Um, it's kinda of getting ridiculous, honestly, but that's what we, that's what we do. Um, but finding that out. Uh, the other big thing is how are you gonna feed those babies? Are you gonna creep feed them? Are you going to let mom take care of them by themselves and just wean them and be happy with whatever they have? Um, depending on which kind of model that you selected or are thinking about doing from our previous slides can dictate how you want to implement this into your program. Um, yeah, you're definitely going to get higher weaning weights if you, you creep. But there comes a point that if all you're doing is just taking pounds of meat to market and rolling, your inputs are going to get too high and where that's going to be. Some people will do it regardless and that's fine too, but you got to weigh that cost for what you're going to do, what your ex expectations are, 
what you're expecting out of this this project this project in this industry um, and that D point obviously you can do a combination of all these um, pasture graze with supplemental feeding and you creep um, or just creep the babies and don't do anything with the moms just let them be on pasture I mean there, there you can plug and play and switch around and do a whole lot of different proportions with that um, the other thing after we get these things fed we got to keep them healthy we got to keep make sure we're feeding the livestock and not worms um, having a good shot protocol um, your extension resources are a very good uh, touch point for that um, if for some reason they don't know the answer a lot of the veterinarians around uh, dr. Beth Johnson is probably one of the best um, around here to do a lot of those questions um, Sawyer Williams out of Owenson, Kentucky we've dealt with him quite a bit he's a really good resource to use um, there's a lot of really good vets in the state that can answer those questions for you um, keeping those does healthy mom can't do a good job raising babies if she's not taking care of herself um, she's our employee for the year year in year out hopefully um, if we take care of her she'll take care of us at least that's our intention um, so I'm making sure that he's she's at her her utmost quality of health when she ever were asking her to work really hard for us um, I put facility maintenance here in animal health because it's a point that some people don't even think about is if you're asking those babies or those does to run through six inches of mud to go eat to go drink to go take care of her babies to just be alive they're not going to perform at the level that they would if they were on pristine concrete with just two inches of shavings now, I understand that's an unrealistic expectation to have for the duration of something's time while it's on your farm but helping to maintain that keep a cleanly keep a clean environment for them to grow to to do what you need to do um, is a huge portion of that um, and then in my opinion everything that we've talked about so far is a mute point if we don't have a good clean water source because they're not going to eat they're not going to mature right they're not going to carry those babies they're not going to milk for us they're not going to be able to do anything if they don't have a good water source um, there's lots of different options within that too back to time money and facilities um, you can go the automatic water route I've seen a lot of goats and sheep be put on automatic waters that are designed for cattle and that they work really well especially for mature animals or yearlings that you're growing out um, babies have a tough time with it obviously physics doesn't allow them to push it down because they weigh the same amount as the ball um, we've gone the route of you can see kind of in the, or I think you can in the picture uh, there but the uh, we do the small three gallon buckets in all of our kidding pens and every time somebody goes in the building those get cleaned out brushed out cleaned out fresh waters put in um, they go into bigger pens we have bigger and bigger buckets to the point where it's 55 gallon drum with cut in half and that's what it is that might get actually cleaned once a week but clean water good water um, vitally important we don't have that we don't have anything uh, next we're gonna be talking about our marketing portion um, we've been talking about it all day but I think it's the most important part of this entire conversation besides our, our water we just hit is what are your goals define your goals write down your goals talk to your family about your goals um, if you don't have goals or aspirations for this project for this industry then you're not gonna accomplish a ton because you're just going to be kind of doing whatever you feel like doing that day so making sure that you have something that you're pushing for and trying to do uh, and no matter what you're doing in life I think is most important the second portion of this is do you have the right genetics and the facility and enough time to attain that goal so if you're telling me that you want to raise goats that are going to have a hanging carcass of 75 pounds at 180 days but you've got angora and dairy crosses it's not going to work out too good uh, if you are telling me that you want to do the recip route in the sheep project but you've got frame sheep hampshires that might not be the best route for you um, and at that point it comes down to either adjusting your goals to the genetics you have or adjusting your genetics to fit the goal that you're trying to do 
um, whichever one of those makes the most op best for you. And then timing of your kitting window or your lambing window. Um, making sure that those animals are aged appropriately for whatever market you're trying to hit. If you're trying to hit a specific um, holiday market for your lambs or goats, they have to be the right size for that, that sale day. Um, if you're working with producers on generating recips, are they at the right age that when they're grown out, they're ready to be utilized without maxim or increasing the feed cost for them and holding them for a whole extra winter? Um, there's a lot, just making sure that all those are correct for you and your goals is very important. Um, and then kind of defining what your marketing options are and what you want to do. Um, they're very traditional, tried and true market options out there. Um, taking kids to market, just sell them to somebody down the road, not really promoting it too much, not doing anything big there. Um, and those aren't too groundbreaking. Everybody knows what those are. I don't think I really need to dive deep into those today. Um, if we do, by all means, let me know. And then if you, have, if you want to do something else with a value-added option, is that what you is that what you need to do? Is that the right choice for you? Do you have enough time to make sure that that is not done in vain? Are we going to make sure that it, it, we can actually benefit from what we're putting into it? Uh, and just the time involved with that. I mean, you say, oh, I want to sell lamb and goat at the farmer's market. That sounds really cool and fun, but then you don't think about the time it takes to go to get them processed. Go pick those up. Fill in the coolers every Saturday. Basically getting rid of it all Saturday for three, four, five months or however long your market's open, selling those. Um, there's a lot involved. So just making sure that you're aware of what you're getting yourself into at the beginning. Um, and like I said, you can change stuff all the time, but making sure that you know what you're getting into before it's too late. <clears throat> um, we're going to open it up into some questions now. Um, I'd love to dive deeper into specifics for each of you all. Um, questions you may have, things that you've thought about doing or hadn't. Um, kind of how that's going to work. I think Ashley had to jump out, but if anybody that's joined us virtually has any questions, um, please let them know. Um, I've been told if you're here in person, they, you'll need to wait until there's a mic so that everybody online can hear you. Um, but with that, do you have any questions for me or would you like to dive deeper into anything? Well, I really want to try to provide some value to you guys um, with what I've seen and what's going on. And could you introduce yourself, where you're from, um, so everybody knows on? Hello, my name is Giselle Herrera, my husband Sam, we're from Gravel Switch, new farmers, survived lambing season last year, all of them live, that is such a goal for us, thank you. Um, I have a question about water, because I, you know, water is really important, and of course last year we had a drought, mm -hmm. you know, and you, we were using um, a lot of water, but would, do you ever use rainwater? Do you do a catchment system? Because I uh, want to try, we're trying to be more sustainable. Yeah, uh, thanks for your question, Giselle. That's a, that's a very admirable thing to try to do. Um, we've never dealt with it. Um, I know what it involves. Um, I think that's something you'd have to have someone come out to your barn and see is this attainable. Um, we use city water for everything. Um, it works out really well. I mean, it's, it, it costs quite a bit, but um, we know it's there, it's ready to go. If something goes wrong, somebody will come fix it. Um, the rainwater is definitely something you could look into. I think that it comes down to mainly square footage of space available for that rain to be caught and then your ability to reservoir, catch whatever that water would be. Um, I've dealt with some people that have done that, um, primarily in the western part of the country uh, where it's a lot drier. And uh, their biggest issue that they are coming with is getting that water out of whatever container it is that they're holding it into and making sure that that pump's good um, or that siphon or that gravity is enough, whatever it is. Um, and then maintaining maintenance on everything, um, pipe bursts squirrel 
drills a hole into the bottom of the reservoir, it can all go away. Um, but definitely something to look into. I think it's a very admirable thing to do, and I think that's really cool that you're looking to be more sustainable within your program. Okay, so I wanted to know, um, one of the specifics is how safe is that water? I mean, would you, if you if you had that facility to do that, would you use rainwater? If I was doing it, I think if my it's back to goals, like we talk about with everything. If my goal was to be 100 percent sustainable, and I wanted to not be I me mean, off grid, wanted to sell that, which is a great selling point, especially in our marketing. If you can say, I have this leg of lamb. It cost 30 bucks, but everything that lamb has ever had in its body was grown within the four corners of our property. That's a really cool point. So if that's what you want to do, I think that's great. I personally would not do it. I think that the water is cleaner, it is safer, it is more reliable on a city water or well source. Uh, on a city water or well source, um, a lot of people don't think about fecal matter or debris or contaminants um, that's coming from your roof. I mean, birds poop on it, birds pee on it, squirrels get on it, you could get, there's a number of things that could go wrong. Um, people have been doing it for hundreds of years, so it's probably worked pretty good. So I'm not saying don't do it at all. Um, it's just, where are your goals, like we've been talking, and kind of how is this, are you going to outweigh the benefits and the cost of it? Um, now, I think if you, can, if you can get a leg of lamb to market or rack of lamb or whatever and say, yeah, every single thing that's put into this animal was either grown or raised here or at this feed mill 10 miles down the road, and you can sell that story and put that with your branding and push that up together and sell that, it's going to take more time because you gotta talk to people about it or tell people about it or have a website that talks about it or whatever it is. But I think that's a really cool thing to explore. Um, you could increase your overall price per pound by doing that, but it's gonna take more time. It's gonna take more effort. Um, I don't know what your personal situation is on occupation or time allowed or even physical capabilities, but I think exploring that and seeing what that would look like, it'd be something to be kind of cool. Um, maybe doing it on a small scale and selling it to a few families first and seeing how that kind of plays out um, would be kind of interesting. Maybe we got a virtual question. Yeah, we have a question from online. What are the basic vitamin and mineral supplements that new goat farmers should know about? Uh, thanks for that question. Like, uh, again, I am not an extension employee and I do not have a lot of research and graphs and really pretty things to talk about here. I have more real life experiences. Um, I feel more comfortable talking about that. I think that's where we're gonna find most value today. But we do give um, all of our does a CDT shot before the kid. Um, then we will give the kids a booster. Uh, we break that up into two different shots. So it's supposed to be five cc's all at once. We give it three at one time and then two weeks later we'll come back with a two. I don't like giving a seven pound baby five cc's of anything. I think that's kind of, kind of messed up. Um, so that's what we do with that. And then we'll also give them a B12, a BOC, and a thiamine um, shot, about a cc of each, um, to help with polio, overall appetite development, and um, just help them with all their joints and making sure everything is ready to go. Um, also, I mean, being born is terrible. I mean, it's a really stressful time for mom and baby. Um, so that BOC just kind of helps them figure it all out, relaxes them a little bit, helps them with a little bit of that pain management. Um, I know that's overkill, but um, that's something that we do for sure. Mr. Neville. He's afraid I'm gonna ask him a difficult question, and I'm not yet, but I wanna reference the water issue. Actually, Dr. Tope here at Kentucky State University can do uh, farm water testing, and some of the KSU folks can tell you how to get in touch with him but they can do, he can do testing for the, specifically for that water issue. Dr. Tope, T-O-P-A-Y, and any of the, no, I'm gonna spell it T-O-P-A-Y, and y'all tell him I spelled it like that. <laughs> Actually, Jonathan is correct, it's T-O-P-E, but. 
Uh, he cut my mic off. Hello? I don't blame him. So your brother had a question about, he just texted me about where do y'all get y'all's uh, recips? You were talking about recips. And actually joking about that a little bit, but t tell that sort of why y'all do recips and what the recip program is about and stuff like that. Does that make sense? Um, we do, well, just breaking it down into layman's terms, we have an embryo transfer program. Um, we will super ovulate donors that are of high quality. Um, so the doe kid that's pictured here is the grand overall doe at the Kentucky State Fair in 2021. She is a product of our embryo program. She is a flush mate to a buck kid that we kept. Um, we've sold semen on him all over the country. Um, we sold the first three embryos of this doe's producing um, at a national sale for a lot of money and a family in Texas bought those embryos that we put into our recipients, which is a surrogate, if you're breaking it down for human terms. Um, he then took those surrogate recips home um, and is due to kid those out next week. Um, we also have some flush mates back at our house that we will take and then sell um, at a national sale in Texas um, to kids that'll go all over the country. Um, so the purpose of the embryo transfer program is to maximize the overall impact of acute, fee, acute a few key females within our program. Um, we've identified about three different doe families in our 35 doe herd that uh, we are actually trying to expand upon, improve. Um, we've been doing embryo transfer for three years now, um, counting regressions and counting um, slip, slips on recips and the donors themselves. Um, we're averaging about eight embryos per flush. Um, then we're averaging about an 80% conception rate uh, which is really high. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute I think for reasons that I think is why that that happens. Um, national average for conceptual rate on embryos is about 60, 65%. Um, we will travel to Indiana to Dr. Tad Thompson's the reproductive specialty group uh, to do those procedures. He does them in his lab there. Um, he collects our semen there. They store our semen there. They ship the semen out to producers all over the country. Um, Really enjoyed working with him. He's a great friend um, and a great resource for us to use. Um, but the recent portion of all this, um, Mr. Neville, good friend, neighbor, known him my whole life, shows how old he is, I guess now. And he uh, he does forage grazing, but you want to deal with weathers because you don't want to deal with babies. But your wife wants to have babies at the house, so we came up with it. Goat babies, goat babies, yeah. All the goat babies she wants. That goat, that baby fever doesn't extrapolate over species. Um, so we'd been discussing. We knew that he had some really good does. Uh, they're, what are they, Spanish, Kiko, just, they're a hodgepodge of good genetics. Yeah, so. Savannah Kiko based goats are primarily white, creamy, colored, tan. Um, so we are buying the doe kids off of him at weaning. Uh, you keep them in the background them for about what, 60 days, 30, 60 days. Get them on good feed, get them mostly bunk broke. And then we, get, we take those females, um, bring them to our house. We background them for a whole year and then we will utilize them in our embryo transfer program um, as 18 month olds to then kid at two, roughly, 21 months, 24 months old. Um, we've expanded that and we've worked with one of our 4-H kids that buys our market goats from us um, as part of his SAE project. He doesn't have a ton, but we usually end up with about five doe kids from him each year. Um, he just sells all of his males to market um, and then we take all of his doe kids. Um, it's proved to be really good for us. Um, it's been a great relationship with Mr. Neville. Um, we've had some back and forth on, he wants some color in his goats for his grazing management customers. Um, 
we wanted a little different thing in genetics for the recent portion of it, so we kind of came up with a compromise on what buck to use. He used that buck, then we took all the kids like we did, and it's worked really well. Um, they've been some of my favorites that we've had. Um, and just having those really high-level females from a commercial background, um, they may not phenotypically be the best goats in the world. They may not look the best. I think they look great, but just having them have a very consistent quality upbringing with a good mineral program, good feed program, good nutrition throughout, um, and staying within their contemporary groups has helped us immensely with our conception rate on our embryo transfer program. Um, it's been a really good product for us to have. I have producers calling me every other week. Hey, I need 15 recepts. Do you know where any of them are? I need 12. Do you know where they are? Um, it's more cost efficient for them to just buy mature does or use and just use them next week for their embryo transfer program. I personally enjoy raising those recepts up, taking just as good or better care of them as I would our future donors that we're going to have and pushing them along. Um, I think there's more people that are willing to do that if they're willing to say, I can get 20% extra conception rate, maybe, on my embryo transfer program if I take the time and do everything else with these recepts. Um, so I think that's a really big portion that um, was a need for us. We found, a, found an outlet for it. I think that it's something that if, if you have time and it's within your goals, um, something to definitely look into and try to explore. Um, most people, if they're just, the average producer that's going to be doing an embryo transfer program is only flushing two to four females. Most of them are doing it once a year. Some are doing it twice. On average for us, we like to have about eight recips per donor when we go to flush day. Um, Dr. Thompson is very strict on his recips, and he will reject about 50% of them. And we want him to do that. Um, not that they're bad, not that there's anything wrong with them, but you're messing with Mother Nature a whole lot when we're doing this. And the closer we can get that recipient's reproductive track to what that donor's would have been, because it's, it's been taken out, even if it's a couple hours off, it's going to decrease our chances. So if we can get everything within about two hours of where it's like exactly where it's supposed to be or it's progressed, the better. Um, so he'll reject them if they're, oh, this one, she, she was ready at six this morning. It's noon, so we'll, we'll be done with that one. Um, so I guess my bigger point is if you can find those people that are wanting to start an embryo transfer program and they only have one or two donors, which is the majority of people when they're first starting to do this, it only takes 12, 16 head of doe kids or ewe lambs. So if you have 20 ewe lambs at the house that you don't know what to do with, but you want to keep three or four, or you sell the bottom three or four with your meat market, with your males, and then you take those higher end ones and you sell those to the producers to use as recips, um, that's an added value to you. They're willing to pay it because they know, hey, that we have better genetics on these. They, it's known predictability on what they're going to look like, what they're going to do, how they're going to produce. Um, it's definitely something to explore. Um, it's been a huge part of our success and it's really been, been a big part of what we do. Did we have a, another question? Yeah, my name is Samuel. Um, we've just been doing sheep for about a year and almost two years. Um, my question is about processing. Do you have any background in processing and legalities of processing meat for sale? Oh, I guess our niche would be, we're, we're not only farmers, but we've been all over the world so we can cook. Yeah, so I wanna process the meat for sale after we cook it. There's legal processes to um, go through to process the meat. I can't do it. So you can't process your own meat on farm. You can sell that animal and have 
like sell that animal to someone who can come to your farm and process that meat to take with them, or you can send it through a USDA certified facility to have it processed, and then you can take the meat and cook it um, and have like a restaurant type certification if you want to. But you cannot process that meat on your own and then sell it to an individual. You can sell a live animal to an individual who can then process that on your farm, um, but you cannot process the meat yourself and then sell that meat. It's the USDA rules and regulations they have here in Kentucky. Can you sell the whole animal to that person? I can't hear you. Even if we sell the whole animal to that person, process it on our farm, um, prepare it on our farm for them. That's a little bit of a gray area. Um, there's a lot of um, religious groups that actually uh, will do that. There's a place in Lexington called Slaw Market. Kenya Abram is kind of doing something like that, and I can connect you with her later if you would like for me to. Um, also, so she's doing something kind of similar to that. She's not exactly cooking it on her farm, but she is having them come in and she's helping them process. She has a facility there for them to process in on their on the, her farm. But if you are, um, if you're selling it, if you want to just sell packaged meat or something like that, there's a USDA process you have to go through. Great question. Thank you. Have another one online? Yeah, um, one of our online viewers asked, what do you recommend putting in a first aid kit uh, for, your, for their goat farm to take care of basic wounds, eye care, et cetera? Um, pretty much what you have in your kit. Um, swap out Band-Aids for Acerat or some kind of type of gauze. Um, we use a kind of a, a puffer product it's a yellow powder I don't know the name of it right now for eye issues a lot of uh, pink eye or something that's in it or, or what have you on that portion of it but basically just whatever you have in your kit would would be what we have in ours um, I mean for you yourself and your kids take a farm version of that out um, we have a couple of them at the house because my son does boy things and <laughs> and he needs stuff all the time, and um, that, that's a lot of what we use. Um, does, don't make it too hard. These, it, at, at the end of the day, goats, yeah, they'll find a way to die, but goats, will, they're, they're hard, they're, they can be hard, but if you break it down, they need food, water, sunshine, somebody to look after them, keep up with them, um, just keep an eye on them, and if something does come up that you don't understand reach out to someone who does one of the extension people we have here and a vet um we've been doing this for 23 years and i'm learning something every every go around we learn something new uh we change something up um we want to do something different so uh just figure out what works for you do we have any other questions here um this is my contact information. Um, if you all have any other questions, um, either here or virtually, um, reach out. Email is probably the best way to do it. And uh, we can try to answer any other questions or if you would like to explore something further. Um, if I don't know the answer, I probably know someone who does. Um, or I can point you in the direction of someone who does know the person who does. Um, but it's a pleasure being with you all today. Um, it means a lot that you all had me come out. And uh, I think you're going to have a couple new pretty good speakers. Um, Mr. Neville, are you ready to come up, sir? Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Well, thank you very much, Derek Jeffries. I, I think I'll stand on my tippy toes so that I don't have to move the microphone because I know David's going to need it too. Um, I just wanted to mention something real quick. The water quality program that we have here at Kentucky State University, uh, we have a grant to bring you, uh, for you to bring your water samples in for us to test. You can do that. There's four different locations. There's one in uh, Bowling Green. There's one in Eastern Kentucky. There's one here at KSU, and there's one in Laurel not Laurel County, um, 
Hardensburg area as well, Elizabethtown area. So if you need more information about that, Dr. Tope is going to be speaking on the water quality program at our farmer's market third Thursday next month. So definitely come out to that. And I have some more information that I can give you on that here uh, for the people that are here and the people that are online. Uh, you can email me at joni.nelson at kysu.edu, and I can get you more information on that water quality program. Uh, right now, we're going to go ahead and have David Neville come up from Capstone Farms. He's going to be talking about goat browsing. Thank you. Thanks, Joni. Thanks, to everybody, for coming out. Uh, this is going to be a, a little more informal presentation, and so I just want to talk about the practical sort of side of uh, goat browsing. Um, we've been doing this for a few years. And actually, I purchased uh, uh, some goats to clean up my own farm. Uh, I didn't want to really use chemicals to clean up the fence lines. I got tired of pouring diesel in my tractors and, and mowing a lot. So I purchased some goats to, to, to help clean up. And so that's the sort of the way we got started. And then I talked with Dr. Ken Andrews, who was at that time the the uh, ruminant specialist, small ruminant specialist here at Kentucky State University, and he helped me and the, the crew here did a lot, and then met some folks who were already doing this sort of work. So have had a lot of help uh, along the way. Uh, we concentrate really on those folks that, uh, I'll say this, have a, a an understanding of what goats can do, right? So we try to set expectations. So if anybody's interested, uh, in doing this as a business, I would suggest first and foremost set expectations on your customer's part as to what goats will and won't do, right? So browsing, so sheep, as we know, are grazers. They're looking at the grass. Goats, they're looking up here. They're looking at the brush in, in bushes, right? And so bush honeysuckle and Japanese honeysuckle vine and brambles and stuff, that's really where goats shine, right? To, uh, to go in and clean up areas. And primarily that's what this is, is a way to clean up areas. Sometimes it's an overgrown cemetery just so they can get in and kind of see what they have to clean it up. And sometimes it might be a park, sometimes private uh, landowners. We had a, uh, uh, a family in, up in Scott County here in Kentucky and they had a piece of woods on their property and had two boys and they wanted the boys to be able to get out into the woods and build trails and have fun, but there was a lot of poison ivy. Uh, and um, if somebody says, well, can goats eat poison ivy and be okay with that, you might ask my wife, she used to have two pet goats. She's a nurse. She went to work one Monday morning. She had this stuff all over her neck and her patients and coworkers were a little concerned. What happened was her pet goats got into the poison ivy in the fence and then kissed her all on the neck. David Neville didn't do that. It was the goats, right? But the point is, there's this myth about what goats or sheep even, but what goats will or won't eat. You know, you hear, we hear all the time, goats will eat anything. They'll eat anything. And actually, goats are really more particular about what they eat than maybe we are, right? They have their specialties like bush honeysuckle, we're not going to eat that, or poison ivy, and nobody wants to fool with that. But they really, if we go out and set up a perimeter, and I'm going to talk about the cost and how to set up things in a, in a minute. But if we go out and set up a perimeter, usually what happens is the goats trot around the perimeter and say, okay, where am I? Where's my boundaries? Where's the hot wire? Kind of thing. And then they, in mass, will pick a certain uh, almost specific type of, of, uh, of thing to eat. Bush honeysuckle is one of their favorite, right? So they all go to the bush honeysuckle and eat that. It, that's all cleared out. They go to the next thing, maybe Japanese honeysuckle vine. Then they go to the next thing until, um, and folks say, well, how do you know when to, to uh, take them off? When they start eating cedars, which they will, when they start eating the cedars, we know it's time to take them home, right? Um, there are lots of questions about you know, how do goats do this and what the costs are. And I'm going to go over some of that stuff from my, only from my perspective. This is not scientific research or anything, but this is on the ground kind of work that we've done, right? So let's kind of dig into the, um, the cost side of things, right? And typically somebody, the first and foremost answer 
that I'm not even smart enough to answer is how many ghosts does it take to clear an acre of, of, of ground? There are so many variables, and just to list off a couple of those, you know, uh, brush and weeds and all that stuff, if you get a little moisture, they blow up, right? Grow really fast. If it's a pretty dry year, they don't grow very fast. So the goats can eat a certain amount per head per day. If the stuff is really growing, they're gonna eat and get full and eat and get full, etc. So uh, what the terrain looks like. Now goats, as we know, can climb on the top of this building probably, right? But the steeper the terrain, the rougher the terrain, the farther they have to walk, the less they're gonna eat. So that factor factors in. How many goats do you have on the property uh, at one time? How big an area is it? What are those goats, are those, uh, you know, fairly new weaned weathers that are weighing 60, 70 pounds? Or I've got two big boys, number, I don't give them names by the way, so my wife don't keep them all. But we have 29 and 30. Now 29 and 30 are two big weathers that are like five, six years old. That's old for a weather. But them boys is big, they're like 225 pounds. They walking and talking to eating machines, right? And so they're, they're consuming a bunch. Those weathers that were mates to, to Miss Jeffrey's uh, uh, kid, the daughters, or the females, you know, they're 60, 80 pounds. So just naturally, them two big boys gonna eat a lot. The smaller ones don't eat as much, right? The, we, the reason, who knows what a weather is? You're excluded. Who knows what a weather is, right? People ask all the time, well, what is a weather? I just call them used to be boys, right? And the reason we do that, we use those, is primarily they don't have any babies of their own to look after. Because if a, a mom has got babies, she's going, she's not worried about eating or she look, where's my babies? Where's my babies, right? And then if you got a buck, you're looking for a new girlfriend, <laughs> right? So we weather them. All they're thinking about is eating and where to get out, right? If you keep your fence hot, all they're thinking about is eating, right? So they eat a little bit, they relax, they go get in the shade and relax, you know, kind of thing. So that's primarily why we use weathers. Now, not to say if we had a couple of open does, we wouldn't maybe kick them out there, but primarily weathers are the way to go. Just so much easier to handle, uh, so much less distraction, right? So think about teenage boys. You can hurt them, you know, with a rope horse, right? Uh, so that's that's why we don't want those young bucks, for instance, uh, out there. They're looking for somebody, right? So how do we keep them contained? Goats will get out. If anybody ever fooled with goats and said, my goats don't ever get out, well, they're not telling the truth, right? But what we found is we used electric netting, and I think some of it might be on here somewhere, on one of these pictures. You can flip the side if you want, slide if you want. Okay, here. Okay, so we use this type of netting and each of those horizontal strands are hot wire, right? They're, they're uh, electrified. We may use uh, solar ch fence chargers. We may put uh, in a shady area, we might use a fence charger using a battery, or we might, like at home, I have access to house current, so my fence chargers run off of house current. So there's a variety of different methods. The key is to keeping the goats in and the coyotes, everybody's worried about coyotes. Well, I'm gonna tell you, stray neighbor dogs have give coyotes a bad name, right? You will have way more problem, most likely, with neighbor's dogs than you ever will with coyotes. So what we do is clear everything out, put the fence up, uh, before we turn the goats in, and this sounds like a made up story, but y'all try it. I had an older gentleman that was kind of training me and working with me. He said, well, get the fence up and go get some bacon. And I said, well, goats, I think, don't eat bacon. He said, no, raw bacon, put it on the fence, put the fence hot, leave it there for two days, right? So coyotes and neighbor dogs come and test the fence by grabbing the bacon. They go back and tell their buddies, 
that y'all might like goat meat, but it bites back. <laughs> Don't go near it. <clears throat> so those little tips and tricks, and certainly anybody that has questions later will have room for questions, but if you have some questions about how we operate, you know, <clears throat> I can certainly help. But that's really helped us to train the local predator population that they need to stay out. And if the goats uh, find that the wire is not hot, they will go. They will go somewhere, right? So it's really important. So we require, whether they be me or a landowner or a staff person or whatever, to check the, the uh, fence twice a day, once in the morning, once in the evening. Make sure it's good and hot. And if it's not hot, let's go ahead and figure out pretty quick uh, why it's not. You know, but if you keep the fence hot, they'll stay in. Uh, this is, it looks like a water jug there. You know, we were doing a, a um, deal over in Henry County, a sort of a, a research project, and we had a bunch of folks working on the project, and Mr. Al Dilley from Glasgow I was talking to him about how we're going to get water. It was way back in the field, right? No access to water. He said, well, I won't worry too much about it. I said, Every, all livestock got to have water, right? And what I'm learning here. And so he said, well, just put a little tub. They'll be all right. It's, so the point is, the, lo the, 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 the longer they are around green, growing stuff, the less water they'll use. They'll get the moisture out of the, out of the green stuff. So I put a big tank in it and beside the thing, pen, put a gravity feed tank on the back of my pickup truck, and the next day went out there, and I was ready to fill that tank back up. We had a bunch of goats there, right? They had drank about that much. I said, well, they ain't found the water yet. The next day I come back, and they had drank about that much. I don't know if y'all noticed much of a difference, but I didn't. And so the point is that you do have to keep water in front of them and mineral, but one of the questions is, do you need to feed them? No. Do you need to have access to water, even though they drink, don't drink much? Yes. Do you need a good mineral program? In all stages of their life and wherever they are, mineral will make you more money than any other single thing, even feed, right? So we keep a good mineral out. We keep some water out, uh, but we don't worry about the water situation. And we don't really worry about where the fence is going to be put up because there's so many different good options on, on uh, solar chargers or battery chargers or house current, okay? So some components of, of pricing. Everybody want to know what it's going to cost me. Well, if I could had a crystal ball and say, okay, this project is going to be $1,250, right? Or this project is going to be $5,000. Well, what's the difference, right? So some of our cost components, somebody, Jonathan, somebody remind me when I've got about five minutes left or two minutes or whatever. And so we charge a site visit charge. And why do I do that, right? Because people will wear you flat out coming to visit their farm and spend a half a day and then they don't take the project, right? So not that my time's any more valuable than anybody else's, but we start charging a, a, a site visit fee and what we do is charge X dollars here, pay that up front while we are on site and I always, always, always look at the site before I make any recommendations or anything, right? Somebody wants to over the phone, how many goats is it going to take? When can you, be, you know, and all that stuff? We have to do a site visit, or I just don't do it, right? So charge a fee for that. And what I do is just roll that back up into project costs. So if they do just a site visit, I deposit the check and hope it's a good check. If they do the project with the goats, I take, I reduce the total amount of the project by the site visit. Transportation fees, right? Costs your time, e effort. Uh, fuel to get them there so we charge two dollars per loaded mile what is a loaded mile right it is from when the goats are on we go out and we pick up the goats right a, a trip out and a trip back <clears throat> just to cover the cost so we're not making any money off that just to cover the cost and then we have a setup fee and we charge um, and we can do as little or as much as the landowner wants us to do so we can set up the thing completely, including taking weed eaters out and cutting us a small path uh, to put the fence up. Because you're going to have to have a cleared path for that netting so it doesn't get drowned out by weeds, right? And so we can do all that, whatever they want us to do. Uh, we have a per hour, per person charge for that, right? Because it's, again, it's your time, effort, and energy, right? Now, if you've got a local community 
uh, cemetery that you want to, as part of a volunteer group, clean it up and use goats, you may not charge. But if you're doing this for a living, you know, you, you got to charge something. And then we have a cost per head per day. That's the only th way that I know of that we can be fair, right? Because if somebody says, okay, what's this, you know, 5.3 acres of, of uh, ground uh, going to cost to clear up, right? Those variables we talked about, I don't know, right? So what I'm going to do is figure out it's going to cost X dollars and then double that to keep me safe. Not being greedy, but you don't know what you're going to get into, right? So we just do a standard, all those other fees, but then a cost per head per day. And you can figure out what it's worth, you know, to you. Uh, you know, the goat browsing thing is, is there's, we don't make a lot of money on it because I have cattle and I have I've raised pigs out to slaughter and all that stuff too. Uh, but the goat browsing thing has made me more margin, if you think about this, not more gross revenue, but more margin than any other thing we've ever done on the farm. And we've done a lot of different stuff because we send the goats out, leave them out three weeks, and these are rough numbers. I get paid for my time after travel. I bring the goats back home. I bring $200 a piece with them, and I still have the goat. I still own the goat, right? So that's a pretty good margin on, on what we're doing. The thing is, you, somebody's going to have to check them goats every day, right? Somebody's going to have to make sure that the uh, fence is hot. That might be you somebody else. So if you're only doing that project, you can do a little extra stuff, right, to make extra money. But if you got three or four other different things going on, you got to factor that uh, into your time, right? And this is informal. I know I've talked a lot, but if anybody's got any questions, go ahead and you can ask them. If anybody online, uh, anybody with any questions, is this, is this thing on? You gonna hear me? So he's he's going to get a mic, but he's he asked what kind of goats do you use, and actually, not trying to be funny to Eli. But any goat is fine. Any weather is fine, whether that be a, a milk-type goat, milk-type weather, uh, so a Sanin or an Alpine or a, a, you know, a Kiko Savannah cross. I like the crossbreds because they just stay healthier and stuff. What I wouldn't use, probably, no disrespect to the boars, Mr. Jeffrey's gone, I can say that out loud. The reason is... Those big suckers are muscled up. You don't want to, you know, they ain't, they ain't like to eat, but they ain't walking much. We need goats that will get out and cover a bunch of ground, right? And so I have a friend that uses only milk-type breed weathers. Them suckers are this tall, right? They get big, long legs, and they've got big bellies that consume a lot of, a lot of stuff. But we use a hybrid goat cross. They just stay healthier. Good question. Yes, sir. Hey, um, when you do this goat browsing thing and you're starting out, what size goat do you start out with? And after it's done its job, or or what does it go to the market? Or I've got a client down down at work that's wanting to do this, and I'm doing some research for her, so you know I know a little bit about it, but. I'm just trying to learn some more stuff because she's got a bunch of woods and she wants to clean them up uh, and not use chemicals anymore. So, A couple of different things there. What size goats, you know, uh, what type of goats and all that. So the size, I don't, I don't really focus on the size as much as I do the age. So I want them to be, you know, close to a year old before they even get started. And then I have some mixed... Uh, goats in there so I've got who knows 29 and 30 we talked about them before them them big boys will lead the group and they're out there they know what to do and so they kind of train the others so to speak but I'd like them to be at least a year old is that is that answer part of that question yeah. right and it's, in terms of size you know depending on how the goat grows they might be 70 pounds they might be 150 pounds you know, the important part is that they're good, healthy, and I can't, and I really should have dealt on this more. They, I, I can't emphasize the point enough. They've got to be good, healthy goats. They've got to have good feet. 
The worst thing, the, the best thing about goats is they're the best PR. Hollywood should take notice that the goats are the best PR vehicle ever was, right? And I'll tell you an example about that in a minute. But they're also the worst nightmare about PR if they get a limp. Now, the limp might be cured by a shot, just a quick shot or a quick trim or something like that, but people freak out. They will be calling you at midnight. Your goats is limping. Come get this goat. Oh, the goat's going to die. He's limping. Right, so make sure you don't put any sick goats, limping goats, or anything out on the project. And if you do, have a way, make sure you have a way to sort that goat and take him home. That's the best thing. Take him home, treat him, whatever. Okay. Yes, sir. So, uh, Eli asked some pricing, some cost models. So what I would do is suggest, and I'll give you some idea, but what I would do is go to, and I'm not repping this com company, it's just one I use and I've had good success with. There's a company called Premier One Supplies, right? And, and you can order online anything you need from them. The fence comes in a couple of different lengths, but what we use is I think it's 164 foot long, right? You can set up, uh, I mean, I can set up, a, if the path is cleared, I can set up a mile of this fence in an hour. You know, it's got post. I just take a little uh, dead blow hammer and pound the post in, boom, 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 roll it out and stretch it out. It works really good and it sets up really, really quick. And Eli, I forget the pricing on that, but per roll it's about. It figures out to be about $1.30 a foot. Right, but you can go online to, to Premier and they have all their prices listed. Yeah. Right, so how tall the fence? It, some of it depends on your preference, right? If you keep, and I'll say it like this, if you make sure the fence is hot at all times, you get by with a 40 inch fence, 40, 40 inches tall. If you're afraid that you're gonna have problems with predators and stuff, you might get the taller, the taller fence. But there's, again, back to that website, there's all kinds of different, and they even have recommendations on there for sheep and goat fence. And if anybody's got chickens, they do chicken fence as well, right? Everything loves to eat a chicken, but if you keep that fence hot, it'll keep the stuff out, okay? How often do you have to move the fence out of the way to get the fence? So how often do you, you, you need to move the fence? So as a general rule, um, let me say it like this. You've got a project, and you're working that project for, say, three weeks. And that's what I typically target to be in and out within three weeks. And if you do it like that, you don't really have to worry much about weed pressure against the fence if you've got a good clean path to start with. But if you're using this fence to section off pastures, and quite frankly, I've run across this problem myself, is I leave the fence up too long and there's weed pressure uh, and it short your, dulls your fence, I'll call it like that, right? So if you're doing a goat browsing, off-site goat browsing project, typically you don't have a lot of problems. You know, you might have limbs blow down. I don't know if anybody's seen that big wind we had. <laughs> you have some winds blow down and that causes problems, but there's not generally weed pressure on the browsing project fence, if that makes sense. Okay. You know, this side of the room has been pretty quiet. I know they got it dark over there, but I can't see y'all's eyes. If y'all is it, if y'all awake, raise your hand. Anybody awake over here? Okay, they are awake. Do y'all have any questions? Yes, sir. So, that's a really good question, and I'm going to answer it like this: yes and no. And I'm not trying to be a smart aleck, right? Goats are funny about things. Some goats. Sometimes, depending on the time of the year, the type of goats, how hungry they get, what else is available, will tear up winter creeper. Some goats wouldn't eat it if, if all they had to eat was what the top of, is on top of that table. So 
while that's not a specific answer, most likely, given certain circumstances, they will they will work on it. But it, it's not a tried and true kind of deal. Goats are fickle. Goats are fickle eaters. They ain't eating no tin cans. They may or may not eat winter creeper. But if you got bush honeysuckle, they will run over you to get to that stuff. And the briars, you know, like wild roses and, and, and brambles and wild blackberries, it's really funny. So let me make a generalized statement. Goats will eat what's green, not what's brown. So warn your, if you're doing this, warn your customers in advance, expectation-wise, look, this browsing is not landscaping. So bush honeysuckle will grow up with a bunch of brown uh, uh, areas, you know, the woody part, right? Well, they're going to pick up all the little green off, and they're going to leave this snag setting up there, and your customer's like, well, they didn't clear it up. No, they don't eat wood, right? But they'll eat anything green. On the, like, wild rose or uh, brambles, they'll close their eyes, and they'll reach in and get that one last little green part and clear all that out, but leave the sticky parts, right? Does that make sense? Yes, sir. I am a beef cattle farmer, and would it be necessary, could you run goats with cattle? The reason I ask that is because cattle eat certain grass, like um, ironweed, mud for roses, um, things that cows don't eat. Would it, would it be a special breed to put with those cows, or would you run goat with those cattle? That's a very good question. If you don't mind, I'm going to expand that question a little bit. And so to say multi-species grazing or browsing, does that work? And by that I meant uh, beef, and I have cattle, uh, cattle, goats, sheep, even chickens, right? And some management issues around the, the multi-species need to be taken into concern. So, so a goat and a cattle mineral, pretty much the same, right? Fine. Sheep, you've got to watch about, about copper toxicity. but. But sheep and cows and goats and chickens can all run together. As a matter of fact, I've got a, a calf at home. It was kind of an orphan calf. We brought it home, bottle fed it, and it's out with the goats. It, it thinks he's the goat. Right. So the short answer is yes. And the ideal thing would be to sort of target what you want each species to clear out. And so, for instance, if you got a really nice pasture field with really nice grass, but you got all this old ugly fence rows, right, grown up in bush honeysuckle, y'all notice I mentioned that bush honeysuckle a couple of times. If you put the goats in the, with the cows, they're going to be over here eating the grass, the cows. The goats are going to be over here eating all the fence. So, yes, that's a good plan to do that. Say again. The head of the goat get the fence. You might get a microphone. Yeah. <laughs> so Eli, we ran cattle and goat together. The big issue we have: the goat get caught in the fence. You have to have different kind of fence, or that's going to be a major issue. Well, that's a very good point. So if you if you use standard uh, woven wire kind of field fence, there's a challenge with goats getting their heads caught. And they get through it, and they back up, and they can't get back up. So some folks say don't have the horns. And my wife, when we got goats, she said, what about, she was scared of them. About the horn, what about the horns? And I said, well, we're going to leave the horns on their handles. Well, she found out when I was off going somewhere, some she that she used the go, the horns as a handle, so now she don't say much about that. But even in variety of different ways, goats will get their heads caught. So if you just know that going up front, take a a couple of, uh, extra breaths before you go try to work on it. Watch your thumbs and your fingers, because getting the goats' heads out of woven wire fence will snag a finger or something like that. So you got to be really careful. But Eli, Eli's got a good point. <clears throat> We, we use a, we've done some, where well, we have permanent fence up on my farm. We've done some smaller 
uh, uh, openings in our woven wire fence made for goats to create a, a, a perimeter fence uh, for those. But yes, it's a good point. Yes. We don't know if we eat hemlock. If I refer back to this gentleman and, uh, about winter creeper, again, that's a yes or no answer, right? Uh, there are some very few uh, uh, weeds that will cause a, a problem with a goat, right? Uh, so white root, for instance, is a bad thing. Uh, hemlock is not really a good thing. But my take is if we're in this room, right, and one of the tables in this room has hemlock on it, and the rest is good browsing stuff, I don't worry too much about it. If they get too hungry, they will eat the hemlock. Uh, but if they got plenty of other stuff, so my suggestion, if it's a project kind of basis thing, is when they, if they start eating the hemlock, don't be too excited about it, because I've never had a goat get sick from that. But if they're eating hemlock or cedars, move them to the next pasture. Uh, this is a picture, uh, people talk about what goats eat. You know, my big boys, the 29 and 30, they'll stand up on their hind legs and they'll eat six foot up, right? They'll actually, one goat, they're pretty smart about this, one goat will take go to a, samp, a sapling and push that sapling over and stand on it and the rest of the goats come eat the top of it real quick. So that's kind of what this left picture is about. Are we ready for, did I do that just right, time and right? Are we got, we're okay? What, any more questions? Any, anybody have anything that's, that uh, they don't want to answer, you know, uh, here? I'll be around for a little while. You'll be welcome to get my contact information. I don't have my contact information up there, but uh, the nice lady in the back, Joni, do you have my contact information? Okay. Yes. My neighbor had our, our neighbor had goats, and I wanted the brush cleaned up, and I ended up putting one strand of electric, maybe 18 inches off the ground, so they wouldn't tear my fence up, and that worked. Yeah, if you can get electric and keep it hot, it's really effective on goats, however you do it, whether you're keeping them off of a fence line or, or you know, doing the projects and stuff like that. Now, one thing I will say, goats will get through a hole where a rat couldn't go. If you got goats, they gonna get out. And I don't care how much you work on the fence, so just be aware, if you're aware of that, you don't get too frustrated. If every day you come home and the goats are out, Richmond is a pretty good goat market. Bluegrass Stockyards in Richmond is a really good goat market. I just wanted to know, um, do you do like mass grazing or how, how big of that enclosure, like how many square feet per goat? That's a, that's a good question, but my, one of my standard answers, it really depends on what the area is, what the terrain is, how much you, know, to, you need to clear out. Because if you, if you got a big area uh, that's got just a few bushes in it, mostly grass, goats will scatter out and kind of eat around, you know. You can put a few goats on a big area, but if it's really wooded, overgrown, so for instance, uh, Idler Park in Lexington hired a buddy of mine to do browsing, uh, and they had kudzu, right? And the kudzu, if y'all know, who knows kudzu, right? The kudzu had taken over everything. I mean, they were just everywhere. So he really can find those goats to specific areas to knock that stuff down really quickly, right? But if you've got a big open area, if you've got a cattle pasture, for instance, and you want to just clear out, uh, have goats there to clear out the fence rows, you know, it can be 20 acres, right? So, good question. In your opinion, which goat breeds do best in Kentucky? So the question is, which goat breeds do best in Kentucky? And uh, Cindy thinks I'm smarter than what I am, right? 
because I, I don't know that I can answer that specifically. I do know some of the, some of the goats and sheep and cattle, for instance, that come from out west and back here maybe are not adaptable to our climate. They don't do as well. But any, any goat, so let me back up a minute. Certain breeds are more, I think, more susceptible to parasites, right? And parasites are probably going to be one of your biggest health challenges with goats and, and or sheep, right? And so some of them are a little more, if they come out of, out of really dry areas, right? They've not been exposed to really wet area type parasites, you know, like tapeworms and others, that, that's going to be a challenge. But I think for, for our projects, our goat browsing, anything except a big heavy muscle breed will work. Spanish goats, dairy goats, Kikos, Savannas, any, any of it. So if they're already adapted, adapted to Kentucky climate, about any of them. If you're bringing them from Texas and put them Spanish goats out, they may have some challenges. So that gets back to uh, John Emerson's uh, question. What did we do with them after we're done, right? Well, 29 and 30, we've been doing this with them about six years, right? And so they're done with me when they start causing me trouble, <laughs> right? I'm very serious about that, whether it be cows or goats or anything else or, or a mean rooster, right? Rooster's going to go in the pot. The other stuff going to go on a the trailer. They're going to go find a new home. But if they're three, four, five-year-old weathers and they're still working good and they don't come up with a foot problem, you know, every time you turn around, I'll keep them for a while. And then after that, we'll take them to Richmond. Primarily, my commercial market is going to be Bluegrass Stockyards or Richmond. And again, I'm not promoting that, but it just works better. And the big, bigger, heavier uh, weathers, everybody's looking at them. As a matter of fact, the pin hookers, if anybody knows what a pin hooker is, will search around. So that's somebody that buys the, the livestock before it goes to the auction ring. They, they go out there and say, Here's my card. Next time you have them big weathers, you just call me. I'll give you good money. Well, sometimes it works, sometimes it don't. But we send, we send the troubled, whether it's physically or mentally, troubled goats, one that jumps everything all the time, we send them to, to the, to the uh, primary to the stockyards. You may hungry. I'm up here starving to death, but I'm going to answer any other questions that y'all have, or you can check with me later. What do you like for perimeter uh, if you're um, on your own farm, if you're, say, rotating goats around, um, uh, say, say if you're using high tensile, how many wires would you like? The question really becomes, uh, I, I think, what works for you on your farm and he's asked what works for us i did i don't do high tensile on the farm i've used some in the past at other places for uh for cattle but high tensile even if you keep it really hot goats are too prone to get out of that stuff right and so for perimeter we use a little short fence that's woven wire but you know regular cattle fence woven wires like that these squares are like that so they can't get their horns in uh, through. And it's easy to put up light to handle. I use, you know, I've got some board fence on the farm, for instance, and they're gonna get out of the board fence. So I just came on the inside and lined that with that smaller gauge uh, goat fence. And I will come to your farm and put up any kind of fence you want I just had a question about biosecurity. When you take your animals out and bring them back home, what do you do um, if you suspect something um, that you don't like at another, another farm or another area? So a good question about biosecurity. First and foremost, I always do a site visit. And if I cannot do a site visit, then I don't do the project at all. So if I go out and look, and so, um, you know, there's been several cattle killed over the course of several years by dump sites. And by that I mean 
you know, and there's dump sites all over Kentucky, small farms, right? They take a, they, they junk an old truck or some debris from a blown down barn or batteries. And batteries, junked batteries are the worst thing. We'll kill a goat, kill a cow, kill a horse, kill anything, right? And so I'll go out and look at those sites to see if there's any issues that I can readily spot with those. But primarily, my goats will go to areas that no other animals are associated with, right? So I don't have that much of a concern because there's nothing out there. Now, there might be some wildlife and stuff, certainly, to consider, but I, I've never had any problem with that. A good question, but I just don't have any problems with it. Yes, ma'am. So I'm going to try to explain a little bit about her question, right? There's a certain parasite that sort of attacks the brain, and it's in uh, primarily impacts uh, cervids or deer type things, right? I haven't had any problem with it. Uh, may, I potentially could. What I would do, my first call would be, and, and, and have a good, really good working relationship with your veterinary, right? Have a working relationship that you don't always have to take the animal in for them to see, but if you got a quick question about, hey, when do I administer, I got bred does and they're getting ready to kid, when do I do CDT? Is uh, two months for the kid or a month for the kid? And so I would have a good working relationship with my veterinarian and ask that question specifically to your vet and see what they recommend. Do you what kind of parasite control program would they put you on? And it's important to have a program. Go ahead. Does that, does that help? I don't have a problem with my farm. Right. Right. And, and sometimes you have to, you know, we hate to say this, but you have to put an animal down, right? You have to clear. Yeah. Yeah. Joni, have they had enough of me? I don't know, maybe. <laughs> Any other questions anybody has? And I'll be around for a couple of minutes. So thanks. For well, we know you're going to eat lunch. You already said you were hungry. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, David, for all your information, and thanks to uh, all of our speakers today. Uh, we have a few more speakers after lunch, but right now we're going to go ahead and uh, break for lunch for those of you online, and just watch, and uh, we'll be, be back here in a little bit after lunch. Can, you, can, I, can I just ask one favor from this group? Maybe. So I didn't, y'all notice I didn't check my phone while I was talking to y'all, be respectful of your attention and stuff like that, but it's funny. So I didn't check my phone out of respect for y'all, uh, but it's funny. I had just said, make sure you have a good working relationship with your vet, right? I just got a, t I can't make this up, Joni, look here. I just got a text from my vet that says, literally just now, it's my birthday, you need to sing to me. <laughs> Can y'all help me sing happy birthday to my vet? Let me call, would that be okay? Okay. Clark. Y'all can call him Dr. Sloan. Me and John are going to call him Clark. And I'll give you the motion here. Take him off speakerphone for just a minute. He might say something. <laughs> All right, don't say nothing bad. I'm going to put you on speakerphone. Hold on. Day to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, dear Clarky, happy birthday to you, and many more. That's it. That's made my day, man. There we go. <laughs> He's made his day. All right. Hey. You were in the church choir, weren't you, David? <laughs> we could tell. No, I'm just kidding. I was once, but way in the back.
<laughs> that was me too. Um, so, okay, so those of you that are still left here, um, if you will, we're going to go out this door on the left to grab lunch and then come back in the door on the right. It'll kind of make things flow a little better. And uh, have a good lunch, and we'll see you in a little bit.
Well, good after lunch to everyone. Did y'all enjoy that? You did? We're going to go ahead and get started with the rest of our program uh, this afternoon. Right now, coming up next, we have Morgan Wimmer with Kentucky State University. She's going to be talking about sheep and goat health. Morgan? Thank you, Joni. Um, so like she said, I'm Morgan Wimmer. I'm an extension assistant for livestock programming here at Kentucky State University. Um, and I will speak to you a little bit about sheep and goat health. So signs of illness and common diseases that a lot of people find in their herd and how to prevent and treat those things. Um, first of all, biosecurity. To, before we know about what diseases, we need to know how to keep potential parasites and diseases off the farm. Um, so when you're buying new stock, or if you have stock that is sick, make sure we quarantine those animals. And they do not, you want them to be in a completely different area. Um, a lot of times people put them in two separate pastures, but they can touch nose to nose through a fence line. So that isn't going to be a true quarantine. You're gonna wanna make sure that they can't touch each other nose to nose. Um, they can't use the same feeders. They can't use the same waterers, things like that. Um, when you are purchasing new stock, make sure you're purchasing those from a reliable source. So a reputable breeder or at the stockyards, make sure those animals have been vetted um, so that there's a lot of times there are vets that work at those stockyards that check those animals as they come in. Lay eyes on them yourself because a lot of times you can see if there's potential issues while you're looking at them. Uh, limit farm visits. So limit how many farms you are going to and how many people that have animals are coming onto your farm. You can pass those bacteria, viruses, parasites through your clothing and your shoes, your truck tires, your trailers, things like that. Um, and that's not saying if your buddy needs help not to go help them, but just be careful of the shoes that you're wearing um, I know when I had animals, a lot of times I had a pair of boots and those only touched my barn. I had separate shoes to go to other barns. Um, so things like that is very helpful. Signs of illness. Before we know what that is, we need to know what to look for so you know if you have got a healthy animal or a potentially sick animal. Um, a lot of times they're going to have decreased appetite. Their hair isn't going to be as smooth and shiny. Um, they're not eating depressed, things like that. Um, species, so age and repro status are gonna have a big effect on those things. So if you've got a doe or a ewe that is due to kid any day, um, she might be off feed because she's in labor. She might be um, laying down more than normal because she's in labor, things like that. So those are things you need to be mindful if you're trying to determine, is my animal sick or or is she getting ready to kid or lamb, things like that. Um, check their temperature. If they're running a fever, if they're too cold, that's super common, most of the time sign of bacteria, virus. Eyelid color, so that's gonna be your FAMATRA scoring. That's gonna be a huge telltale sign of the barber pole worm, which is a very common parasite here in Kentucky. Um, do they have diarrhea or a runny nose? That is a very common sign and that is gonna help you think of things that this illness could be. Is their udder hard or lumpy? If they are in lactation and they're running a fever and their udder's hard and lumpy, a lot of times it's mastitis, um, which is a lot bacterial infection. Um, you're gonna wanna vaccinate. This is gonna be your biggest preventative so that your animals are not getting sick. Um, CD and T, it's gonna treat clostridium, perfusions, and tetanus. Also, Enforce 3, which is going to be a pneumonia and respiratory disease vaccine. That Enforce 3 is going to be half a cc per animal, and it's an intranasal um, vaccine. But um, for any, that's going to be for your adult animals. Any other um, animals, if you've got kids or lambs that are young and you think they need this right now, Contact your herd veterinarian. I am not a vet, so I cannot give you any other information. Um, C, D, and T. Young or unvaccinated animals, you're gonna give them that initial vaccine and then a booster at three to four weeks. 
per label recommendations or vet recommendations. Adult animals, you're gonna give them a booster yearly. A lot of times a month prior to kidding is gonna be your best bet because they're going to get passive immunity, those kids or those lambs will, through their, that dam if you're given it that time frame around kidding or lambing. Parasites, this can cause your animal to look sick or ill and lead to death possibly. So the hamacus worm or the barber pole worm, that is the one that's gonna attach to the stomach lining or the intestinal lining. And they're gonna suck that blood from the animal, which is why we do famancha testing. You're gonna see that pale eyelid color. They're gonna have, be showing signs of anemia, things like that with that one. Uh, lung worms are gonna ir irritate that animal's airways. So you may think they've got pneumonia, you may think that it's a respiratory disease, and it could be lung worms. Um, they do have a different life cycle. So the adult worms will lay eggs, and the animal inhales those or eats, and they go into the lungs. And that's where the larva hatch is in that animal's lungs. And then they cough them back up, that goat or that sheep, and it's now on the grass. And then they eat it, and it's just that whole um, cycle. And then there's coccidia, which is not technically a worm. So dewormers are not going to treat coccidia. It is a protozoa. Um, so you're gonna have to use something different. A lot of times they treat with corid. Um, so when it comes to deworming, make sure you are famancha scoring. That's gonna, that's gonna be the main indicator if you've got a barber pull worm issue. Um, only treat as needed. We do not want to do a scheduled deworming. That can lead to um, those parasites becoming resistant to those dewormers. There's also different classes of dewormers. Um, so there's many name brands, but there's three major classes of those. So if one is not working, you can try a different class of dewormer. Um, tr um, it is also important to treat at weaning or kidding because the stress that is put on those animals at that time can lead to a greater um, susceptibility to those parasites. In super severe cases, if your goat or your sheep is loaded with parasites, you may have to repeat this and deworm again a couple weeks later. Make sure you're doing those fecal egg reduction tests to make sure that you, your dewormer is working, to make sure that your animal needs dewormed because sometimes they, it could be a different illness and it's not a parasite. And if we're deworming when it's not parasites, the few that they do have, we're just making more resistant to those dewormers. Um, so things that lead to disease, illness, other medical conditions, um, the susceptibility of the animal. So if they're super young, their immune systems aren't as strong, or sometimes if they start, when they're getting really old towards the end of their life, their immune systems are not nearly as strong. Vaccination status. If it's time for them to be vaccinated, or they, um, or if you haven't vaccinated yet, if you've got really young animals, that's gonna make them more susceptible to these diseases and illnesses. Stage of production, so are they lactating? Are they, do they just wean kids or lambs? Um, or are they in their prime, middle age? No, they're either in gestation or they get it a couple weeks ago, they're gonna be less susceptible. But during times of stress, so right at kidding, at weaning, um, or when they're young, more, they're more susceptible. Also genetics. Some animals are just genetically less susceptible to parasites, less susceptible to um, illnesses. And some are just genetically more, their immune systems are just genetically stronger. Um, so they can fight these things off a lot better and you may not ever know that they ever were dealing with anything. Nutrition. Um, if you are feeding a balanced diet and you've got clean water sources and they have plentiful access to that water, that's gonna keep them healthier so they're less susceptible to disease. If you've got deficiencies or they're malnutritioned, that is going to weaken their immune system and they're going to catch these more frequently and easier. 
Um, and like I said earlier, stress is going to decrease that immunity. They're not going to have as good of immune response when they are stressed. So times of weaning, times of kidding, um, thing, or if it's a new animal that you just brought onto your farm. Those are very stressful life events for these animals. Um, so keep a closer eye on them at those times. Um, the causative agents, the pathogens. Um, how prevalent is this on your farm? So if you are seeing pneumonia in all of your kids or in all of your lambs, that bacteria is living on your farm. So making, keeping things clean, things like that is going to help prevent that as well. Uh, exposure. So if your pasture is overstocked, they poop where they eat. And those larvae and those eggs are in that feces. So when they, your pasture is overstocked, there's more feces than there is normally. So they're eating closer to that feces than they would be in a less stocked pasture. And they're more susceptible to those parasites. Um, bacteria in the dirty waters. If it's overstocked, or you just aren't cleaning your feed troughs and your waters, and it's gonna grow bacteria. It's gonna um, infect your animals that way as well. Uh, also, some pathogens are just more aggressive. There are some things that are more resistant to treatment naturally, or more resistant to the cold weather so they don't die off in the winter like other things do. Um, so now we're gonna get into a lot of illnesses and diseases that are common that you may see in your herds. Um, there are a ton of causes for scours, which is diarrhea. Um, coccidia is a big one, especially here in Kentucky, um, and in your younger animals. E. coli is another one. Clostridium perfrigens, perf sorry about that, um, which is gonna come from sudden changes in feed. So if you buy a new animal and they were on a pasture-only diet and you start really quickly changing them to an all-grain diet, that can cause things. Um, and then just common dietary digestive upset. They just are having tummy issues. Um, this can be caused by toxic plants. If there are um, plants in your pasture that you are unaware of sometimes because we're not, we all can't walk the pasture every day to figure out what's growing there. Um, overeating, listeria, and a diet change once again. Um, so there are many different treatments for this. Coccidia chorid is a common one. Um, the cd and T vaccine for that clostridium. Um, dietary digestive upset, just be mindful of what your goats may be ingesting. Um, and don't change that diet so suddenly. Make sure you're, if you need to change from hay or pasture to grain to get through the winter, or if you need to send to market in the next couple weeks and they need to gain some weight quickly, just make sure you're switching those diets over quickly. Not quickly, I'm sorry, slowly. Um, prevent overcrowding. So make sure that your pastures are not jam-packed full with as many goats or sheep as you can get in there. Um, make sure your things, your barn, your feeders, your waterers are all clean and sanitized regularly. Um, your animals are vaccinated and monitor for parasites through the fecal egg reduction tests um, and the FAMANCHA scoring. Respiratory disease, um, signs and symptoms of this, cough, labored breathing, um, a runny nose, fever, not eating and just generally depressed and fatigued. They're not moving around, they're off by themselves. This can be viral bacteria or verminous. Um, so lungworm, pneumonia, and then contagious, vi contagious viruses um, are gonna cause those things. Biosecurity with this is really important because these bacteria and these viruses can be passed very easily from animal to animal. Vaccinations, like that Enforce 3, will help prevent this as well. Um, no overcrowding because it is very contagious, especially like pneumonia and these viruses. And when you are got a whole lot of animals in a really small space, they're gonna pass it on that much quicker. And monitoring those parasites for lungworm. Foot scald and foot rot. This is one a lot of people think is the same and they are not. One is extremely contagious, that foot rot. Here it's gonna be passed from animal to animal. That foot scald is not going to be 
as uh, not going to be contagious. It is still a b bacterial infection, but uh, the foot scald is going to be a con an infection in between those two toes um, in that skin in there. And it's going to look red and irritated like it is in that picture there. Um, and this is caused by wet or muddy conditions. So if they're in a barn all winter long and we don't have a whole lot of straw or shavings or whatever we need to dry that up, that is going to cause quite a few issues. Um, you can control this with trimming and foot baths, also antibiotics. Um, just be mindful, in July there is going to be a new law. You are only going to be able to get antibiotics through a vet. You are not going to be able to buy those off the shelves anymore. You're going to have to have a prescription. Kentucky Sheep and Goat Development Office is doing a webinar on March 21st about that. Um, so be mindful of that change that will be happening this year. Um, foot rot is also, it's a contagious bacterial infection and that's going to affect the hard part of the sole. So those hoof walls and the bottom of the hoof there um, and it's going to rot those hard parts away. Um, and this is going to be treated with antibiotics and foot baths. If you have an animal with foot rot, you're going to want to keep them separated from the others because that bacteria that is causing that sole to, um, to rot away is going to get into the soil as they're walking and then other animals are going to then walk on that and it is going to affect their feet as well. Sore mouth. Be very careful with this one. It is zoonotic. So if you've got an animal with sore mouth, they are going to pass that on to you it, through mucous membranes. So your eyes, your nose, your mouth, things like that. Um, there is a four to six week recovery for this. Um, make sure you isolate these infected animals. And like I said, with the quarantine, make sure that they cannot touch like nose to nose through a fence. We want them to be in a completely different area. Um, this is a virus, so antibiotics are not going to treat sore mouth itself, but if those scabs or sores do um, get infected, you can treat the secondary infection with an antibiotic. Um, so if you have a kid or a lamb that has sore mouth and they go to nurse, the udder is a mucous membrane as well, so they can pass that to the dam through their nursing. Um, so you want to be very careful with that. Urinary calculi um, is going to be a blockage in the urethra caused by an imbalance in diet. It is a calcium buildup. Um, males are more susceptible and that is because of that urethral process that is shown in that picture there because that is very narrow. Also, males have a lot longer urethra than females do, so it's harder to get it out. They're going to strain a lot and they may look constipated. Um, so a lot of people think it's just constipation and it'll be okay. Um, but make sure you're checking their fluid output and their fecal output. Um, treat this pre or prevent this with proper nutrition. There is a feed additive called ammonium chloride that you can use to help treat and prevent these things. Um, consult with a vet or the feed label with how much to add depending on how many animals you have and what they weigh, things like that. Um, but this can lead to death because they are not able to expel that urine. CL, um, it is a bacterial infection again. Um, it's going to cause abscesses in those lymph nodes and those lymph nodes are outlined there in red where that goat is. Um, this is extremely contagious. It is passed by the pus that happens when these lymph nodes are flushed or lanced or if they open on their own. Um, that is where the infection is held. So if you've got a goat with CL, keep it isolated. Um, if you are lancing and flushing it with iodine, make sure you do that in an area where none of your other animals can get to it. Because though you can clean it up, you can sanitize, it's not 100%, it is still there, and this is extremely contagious. So a lot of times they can still pick it up. So if you are going to lance and flush it, make sure it is where no one else can get to it to prevent the spread of that. Um, and this also is fatal 
you have, they have internal lymph nodes as well. And if those abscess, a lot of times you won't see it and those can burst and that is what a lot of times will cause death. Um, listeriosis is a bacterial infection that loves the cold. A lot of bacteria in the winter time start to die off because they are not fans of the cold. They thrive in like warm, humid and climates, but not this one. Um, it is often fatal because it causes that gray matter in the brain to deteriorate. Um, and this bacteria is found in decaying plant material, so like moldy feed or hay, things like that. Um, common signs of this is going to be drooping of the facial muscles, especially on one side. So um, it's very similar to like stroke symptoms in humans where they start to droop. Um, they'll drool, they get a fever, they'll go off feed, and they'll be like walking and falling in circles because that one side of their body begins to shut down. Um, to treat this or prevent this, make sure you're keeping your feed troughs clean. Um, avoid rotten hay or feed. So if you see hay that looks a little suspicious, looks like it might not be the best quality, just don't feed it to be on the safe side. Um, keep animals out of your feed storage areas. So if you have a feed room or a corner of your barn where you keep all your feed and hay, make sure that that is behind a gate or somewhere where your animals cannot get to it. Um, this is responsive to antibiotics when it is caught in the very early stages. So right when you see that face start to droop, right when you notice that they're not eating, they're not moving like normal. Um, you can also give anti-inflammatories like banamine or dex. That will help with this because a lot of times they'll start to swell, things like that. Um, but this is one that if it is not caught very early, it does tend to be fatal. Polio is very similar to Listerio, but it is not quite the same. It is a vitamin B1 deficiency, which is thiamine, um, and it does cause deterioration of the brain. So a lot of times you see this if they're not on a balanced diet because a healthy rumen will produce its own thiamine. If your rumen isn't healthy and it's not producing enough, this is a lot of times when we see polio. Um, things to look for, blindness, they call it stargazing. They'll be like looking up at the sky because they don't know where they're looking. They'll also be like running into corners and walls and things or fences, gates, things like that. Um, they will lose their ability to stand and they'll also have seizures, which is what's happening in this picture here. Their whole body just locks up. Um, and this can also be fatal. Keep a healthy room in. A lot of times you do this with a healthy, balanced diet. Um, avoiding high sulfur diets and toxic plants will also help you prevent this from happening to your animals. It is treated with thiamine. So if you see an animal that is just not doing good and you think it's listeriosis or you think it's polio, treat them for both. Treat them with the banamine, the antibiotics, and that thiamine because polio and listeriosis look so similar to an animal when you're just looking at them with a blind eye and you don't know what they've gotten into recently, then you don't know. Maybe you were out for a couple days and you weren't paying as much attention as you usually are, whatever. And so these look very similar. It is not gonna hurt them to treat them for both at the same time. Um, it can only help them. Um, but both of these need to be caught super early, and if they're not, a lot of times they just go downhill very quickly. Do we have any questions? He'll bring you a microphone, sorry. Um, our sheep affected poorly by hemlock, if they get into hemlock? I'm not sure. Um, I do have my uh, Dr. Jesse Lay's email up here um, for questions that I cannot answer. Um, if there is someone else in the room that can answer it, great. But if not, you can go ahead and email her. She is a vet, um, so she would be able to answer that for you. 
Any parasites or illnesses that are dangerous to sheep that would come from horses being on the property? Not that I am aware of. I haven't heard of any. The closest thing I can think of is going to be that mingeal worm, which is going to come from like deer and elk. Um, but a lot of parasites are, parasites are species specific, especially horses being hindgut fermenters instead of a ruminant. Um, so they're not going to have the same parasites there. Can they get too much of the B vitamin, the B1 vitamin? Um, I'm sure there is a point where there is too much. Um, but it is in a lot of min loose mineral. Um, they produce it themselves when they're fed a healthy diet. Um, but just like with anything, too much of a good thing can still be a bad thing. I don't know what that threshold is, though. Thank you guys. If you have come up with any other questions, feel free to email either me or Dr. Jesse Lay. Um, we'll be happy to answer those for you. Thank you guys. Well, at this time, I want to thank everyone for coming here and online. Uh, we're going to, uh, for those of you that are here, we're going to take a small tour of the goat facilities. Uh, for those of you online, uh, maybe you can come out sometimes and we can also offer you this tour. I wanted to tell you a little bit about our next third Thursday. We'll be talking about farmers markets and rules and regulations of, and marketing at farmers markets on uh, next month. It's going to be uh, myself, Joni Nelson, and Sharon Spencer will be hosting that third Thursday uh, next month. So we hope to see you there and have a great day.